whatever you've got. So church, we're gathering people to the kingdom of God. Church is about this in-gathering people into a relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. And it's not just about us individually. It's about us together. We, we, we bless one another. You don't get to hear Mike's poetry unless you come to church. <laughs> He wouldn't even be writing poetry if he wasn't actually thinking about the kingdom of God. And it's a blessing. You don't get to hear the experience, the worship, unless we actually gather together. So what am I saying? I'm saying we are the church. And Jesus is saying to us, we're not the multitude. We're the 12. And he's saying to us, I want you to build with me. So we... In 2023, this church was incredibly generous. We gave $482,000 over the whole year. We blew our budget $32,000, so we went better than we should have, which is awesome because God, you'll see in this miracle, at the end of doing it all, there were 12 baskets left over. With God, there should never be a deficit. There should be leftovers every single time. That's what he wants to do in your life. He wants us to walk with him in a dimension of faith where he can show us the leftovers, which are not leftovers. They're actually a blessing to say, I love you. I, I can do amazing things through you. So this year, we bless you. Bless you. That's all right. I, vi- I have that vibe as well. Yeah, something in the air. So 482 we did last year. We did it last year. You guys are awesome. It was such a blessing for me as a pastor to see the level of generosity. Uh, I just want to let you know right up front, this year we need to do 462K, $462,000. And that's to make sure that, that we, our pastors are healthy. It's to make sure that we can be, meet in this place, that our buildings look after, and that we can do all the ministry we want to do. And it's about gathering people to the kingdom. So the beauty of it all, though, is that there's going to be blessing. The, left, the, the blessing of God for every single person. 12 baskets for 12 disciples. So in this room, 100 baskets for 100 disciples, okay? If we trust God with our giving. All right, that's a little longer than usual, but anyway, let's pray. And, uh, and I'm going to dump my wallet because I give over the internet. Father, you place us in pretty interesting circumstances with Jesus and um, we, we're a bit like the 12 we're like well that was all very good Lord but now what I pray for everyone in this room that this, this year would multiply blessings God as we step out with you as we put our own resources and lives in your hands faithfully love you and trust you would you Pour out blessing. Show us new revelation. Give us strength to do all the things we need to do. And thank you, Lord, that you also bless our families, our businesses, our children, Lord, our careers. Um, As we trust you, you have provision for us. And we believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'll just give you a minute to do that. It's all right, Jess. It's just space. (laughs) I know. I know. All right, Jess, why don't you come and release the kids? Thank you. Woo! All right, quickly, if you have a phone, I know your phone's already out, so don't try and hide it. Can you put in a date for me, please? Everybody, this is for everybody to do. I know, not the parents. The 7th of April is our first Crazy Kids Sunday. Woohoo! So can everybody put that date in? Because Crazy Kids Sunday is one of the events that we have to reach new families in Lane Cove, in Sydney, wherever you are based. And everybody can participate. You don't just have to have a kid to participate. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. Why? Well, because you guys are praying for this event. <laughs> ben, you can't come. <laughs> you surrendered uh, coming many years ago. Um, So if you know a family that you could invite, please invite them. If you don't know any families to invite, please pray for the event.
Um, we do four Crazy Kids Sunday a year. That's four opportunities for new families to come and meet Jesus, for young children to meet the community. Um, and I want to just quickly share, we had a family come last year and he, the father stayed because he wanted to participate in Crazy Kids Sunday. And he said to me, he's like, wow, I've never found a community like this for my kids where they're not forced to be there. Like we haven't paid tuition for them to come. Um, where I don't have to feel like the friendships are forced. It's very organic. And it's very loving. And it just reminded me that the community we have here is great. It's fantastic. It's loving. And it's thriving, and it's great for young families to be in. So please prioritize that time and pray over it and invite people. Okay, got it? Great, thank you. All right, let's pray over our children. Reach out your hands. Lord, we thank you for all the families, all the children in our church, Lord. Lord, we thank you that the community we have is vibrant, it's dynamic, it's loving, and it's full of fun. Lord, we pray this morning as the kids go as the youth go out, that they will meet you in a tangible way, Lord, that you become real to them, you become a friend that comes alongside them. And Lord, we pray for friendships and we pray for fun. Amen. Amen. As they're going out, let's stand ready to worship. Lord, we wait upon you in this space. Work in us, work through us, God. Your spirit is here. justice your mercy revival in our city we wait for you lord let's sing that again we wait for you lord yes we do we wait for you lord for your justice your mercy revival in our city we wait for you lord christ our king be enthroned be lifted high amen christ our Forever glorified, we wait upon you, we wait for you. Hi. 
Come back to life. Can you hear your people singing? Hallelujah. Oh, hopeless, come on. All the hopeless come to Jesus. Let the dead come back to life. Can you hear your people singing? Hallelujah. Your glory, God. Let your glory fill this city. Every nation, tribe, and can you hear your people singing? Hallelujah. One more time, come on. Let your glory fill this city. Every nation, tribe, Every and tongue. Can you hear your people singing? You know, when we're singing that, He is already glorified in heaven. He is already enthroned in heaven. So what are we asking? We're not asking that He be enthroned in heaven or glorified in heaven. We're asking Him to be glorified on earth. Amen. What would that look like this morning for you? If you could say that, why don't we lift our hands, open our hearts. Let's have an encounter with the risen Jesus. I worship you, God. What is in heaven, let it be seen in me. Oh God, we worship you. Seven and Holy, holy, holy. Mighty God. Mighty God. In the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. In the last days, says the Lord, it's not about wars in the Middle East. It's not about this country and that country. It's not about the devil. It's not about the number of the beast. It's about the Holy Spirit being poured out on the church. 
in the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on the church, on everybody who knows me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, we're we're not going to listen here, Ben, until we see, until we draw down what has been given to us. Stoke the fire. Poke coals. There's a fire inside of you. The Spirit of the Lord God is at work in you. The Spirit of holiness. The Spirit of truth. The Spirit of goodness. The Spirit of new creation. The Spirit of gifts. He is with you. He is in you. The Lord made it possible. Stir up the Spirit of God that is in you by the laying on of hands. Don't be intimidated. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and sound mind. The Spirit brings power. The Spirit brings love. The Spirit sanctifies your mind, brings good things to the front and gets rid of bad things. Hallelujah. Oh, let people praise him praise him he is lord he's lord in the valley he's lord on the mountain he's lord in the desert he's lord at the oasis bless the lord of my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name oh i bless you you are worthy you're the greatest politician in the world Lord. we didn't vote you in you earned it Lord, you are here. Bless you. We bless you. So I just want you to do one thing. I just want you to say over yourself this morning, I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I mean it. I mean it. I want us to say it. I belong to Jesus. Lord, I give myself afresh to you. Thank you that you got me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you, Pastor Ben. Let's give him a big hand as he comes. Come on, church. Hey. I wish I had a voice like Leo. Oh, my word. Morning, church. Morning, church. It was a bit like Raw from, uh, from uh, Ted Lasso. Morning, church. <laughs> How you going? It's good to see so many of you back from holidays. Yeah, overseas. Good to go back to the, the country. I met a young man this morning born in the same part of England as me. Yeah, Kent. Kent. Australia's better than Kent, though. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just joking. That's good. Where are you? Where are you at? Are you feeling well? Good enough. Good enough. The year's kicking off, all right. Yeah? I want to to move the needle of your life this morning a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Where? What's the destination of your life? How's that for a, where are we? Beginning of February question. (laughs) What's the destination? What is your life? If your life came full in bloom, what would it look like? Put another way, maybe, what would you like said at your eulogy about you? I know, it's like the best speech of your life and you're not there to hear it, but... (laughs) The end is... Where did you get that from? You must be... Oh, ah! (laughs) He's a prophet. There, there was a rabbi who, who said there are, there are two, he calls them atoms, but two people within us. The person who's working for the resume and the person who's working for the eulogy. Wow. Yeah, in Sydney, I think we catch this a little bit, right? We, we, a lot of our life, we are putting things into the resume virtues, success, promotion, job. And that's not necessarily a job. Maybe that's your home life. Maybe that's your hobby choice, whatever it is, but the resume virtues. But then there's another part of us 
Because if you got to the end and the speech was just, oh, you know, then he got a number of promotions in his life. <laughs> he really earned top dollar. His bank account was just so full. No, he became a pastor. <laughs> no, but if that was the speech at the end of my life, I don't know about you, I'd be like, oh, really? Like that's what my life amounted to? Like a series of resume virtues? Yet there's another side of us that perhaps doesn't get so much of our attention, not so much of our effort or our energy, but something that we do desire, this second Adam, this second person within us that contains what we want said about our life, what we hope our life would amount to. There's a story from some ancient Christians called the Desert Fathers, uh, an abbot who's called, uh, what's his name? Lot goes to see a senior abbot, Joseph. And he says, Abbot Joseph, I, as far as I'm able, I keep my rule of life. It's kind of the pattern of the Christian life for him. I, I f- do my little fast. I, I do my little prayers. And as much as I'm able, I root out the pure thoughts of my heart. But is there anything more? What should I do next? And abbot uh, Joseph turns to him and the story goes, he lifts his hand and the sun must have been behind him because it says his fingers became like lamps of fire and he says, why not become all flame? Why not allow the pursuit of God to consume your life? Not just the little things... I did my little attendance at church. I did my little prayers. I gave my little tithes. I did this. I did that. But why not come all flame? Yeah, like three of us are like, yeah, the rest of us are like, I don't know if I want to burn up for Jesus. <laughs> Let's be honest. Let's be on the two sides of us. Like, maybe, yeah, that sounds nice. Maybe, but a bit painful. But at the end of our lives, what is it that we want said about us? Not just by the people who attend our memorial, but by the Lord himself. Welcoming welcoming us into a life everlasting. Why not take the last of the life that we have and we're holding on to and not release it to God yet and just become all flame? Why not allow the comfort of our life to begin to burn up or the apathy toward God and people burn up? Why not let the pursuits of the rest of our life, the things that we work so hard for, but in the end, we all know we can't take them forward into an eternal future. Why not let them burn up? and become consumed with the pursuit of God. It's it's a little bit crazy. But I, when I was a younger man, a little phrase came to me, speaking of God. It says, you don't inspire mediocrity. Think about who God is. The everlasting creator of, of all things, powerful, beyond measure, holy, which means that he's not, he's not like one amongst a few. He is alone in the type of being that he is. The scripture says in him, there's no shadow of turning. You're not going to turn a corner with God and find there was darkness. He is light and love. He is pure. And yet he's not self-focused. He's yeah other focus. He's giving. We spoke this morning. We come to the communion. The, the God of creation gives himself on the cross, naked, abandoned, ashamed, allows all the reckless evil of the world to be poured out on him, not so that he can get a name, but so that we might receive his name. Yeah. What does that kind of God inspire in our lives? 
once in a month attendance to a gathering. Part of my personality, but I'll withhold some. Or does he inspire a people who are saying, why not become all flame? In the scripture, Jesus is approached by teachers of the law and Pharisees and asked, what is the most important command of all the words that God has spoken that are recorded in tradition and in the scriptures and in in that time, the Jewish religion? How would you summarize it all? And Jesus replies to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang or depend on these two commands. And the follower of Jesus named Paul not many years later, writes this in 1 Corinthians 13, love never ends. Wow. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. And speaking about that time in which God is fully revealed to humanity. Yeah. Jesus returns as the bride for his church. As the, he is glorified. Yeah. Not in heaven alone, but on earth. Every knee bows, every tongue confesses the reality that Jesus is who the scripture always said he was. He says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we only see in a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Why is love the greatest of these? Because one day there will be no need for faith. Because we will see God fully. And the gap that you live in now where you see Him partially and have to believe on His character toward that will shorten why is love greater than hope Hebrew says because you don't hope for something you already have we have a great hope that our God would return that Jesus would come we'd put right all the wrongs of the world the injustice of the world would be dealt with mercy beauty and love and truth and the knowledge of God would fill the whole creation all things would be made new And that's the hope we hope for now because we've not got it. One day we will have it. And so hope will become useless. Because you don't hope for the thing that you've got already. You experience the thing you've got already. If the package is coming from Amazon, you hope that it arrives. But once it arrives, you don't hope it will come. You open it and Receive receive it. But love... But love does not fail, does not end. It passes through. Lord? (laughs) It passes through. It passes through. Why? Because the future, God's future, is not isolated souls floating around, not connected to one another. It is a gathered people with a gathered God. 
And when there's a community of beings coming together, it requires something. Love. This is why the greatest commands of all the words that God ever spoke were love God with your whole being. And just like that, love one another. I think when this old Christian, this ancient Christian was speaking about becoming all flame, he is leading us to a destination where your whole person, if you imagine your your life, your person as a mansion with a hundred rooms, not 98 rooms, not 88 rooms, not 99 rooms, but every room has been opened to the transforming love of God so that your person is now love. You're not gritting your teeth to try and love your brother and your sister who, oh, I got to. <laughs> but the love of God has transformed us so that what Jesus says in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, that you would be Mature like your heavenly Father is mature. What's the context of that? Loving your enemies. What's the image that Jesus uses? God lets His sun shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. He lets His rain come on the righteous and the unrighteous. It's a picture of His love. God's love goes forth indiscriminately, freely flowing. Like, just like you can't block the rain from coming or the sun from coming, do your bit to try and bounce it around, but you can't stop it. It comes freely to all who are in it. Mm-hmm. And this is the image, the picture of where God wants to take you. Your love would freely flow toward Him and freely flow to the people who happen to be in the sunshine of your life. Well, that's a night. <laughs> it's like a sun. song. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, what does a life of love look like? There's simply not enough time to tell you, so you just go figure it out. (laughs) The life of love looks like Jesus. The life of love looks like the person, the character, the life of Jesus. And one of the greatest things you can do to clarify the destination that God has set for your life is to clarify what the life of Jesus was like. Like push past the superficial picture of Jesus that you're at at the moment. Or if it's like an inch deep, go deeper. Go deeper again. Read some things. Baptize yourself in the Gospels. Ask questions about how on earth He respond that way to that situation find your situation in the scriptures in the gospels and then look at how jesus responds to that situation because that's god's destiny for you if you would partner with him and move toward it i want to paint you a picture of jesus perhaps that you've not gone to you know you've seen him as the son of god you've seen him as the one who gives himself on the cross. This is the clearest, most precise laser picture of the love of God is the cross. But how many of us are expecting to do that? How many of us are like, oh, I've got crucifixion this week. I better look at how Jesus dealt with that. No, that this is like a, a big picture, but we need to bring it down to some specifics that match up with our life so I can actually go, oh, Okay, the cross painted into that conflict situation in my life means this for me. So look, look at this. Jesus' life. He was able to transform the brokenness of life, not transmit it. Think about the situations that Jesus ends up in. The anger that might come against him the pain that comes to him, the injustice that comes to him. You, you, me, I mean, you've met me. I don't transform the energy that comes to me. Generally, I reflect it back. Yeah, yeah? you and me, Michael alone, right? 
But Jesus, not once, not once, he, what comes to him is absorbed and then transmitted in a loving Transform. way. Transformed. Sorry, thank you. He is differentiated, not disconnected. He knows who he is. He knows where he came from and where he was going. He's able to be who he was called to be. His character is stable. His mission for life is set. And yet he doesn't have to disconnect himself from people to do it. He's able to have conflict situations without it ending up in a Twitter war. Without someone getting cancelled. I thought, I thought this, like, how wonderful that Jesus is asked questions. Yeah. Has it struck you that Jesus was the kind of person you could ask questions to? Yeah. He walked around questionable. Like, it's hard to be different, and sometimes in being different, we set up some big wall. Don't question it, because I know it's going to end up in a fight. Yeah. I can think of, like, I'm saying that in like three areas of life just come to me like that. Where it's like, I, I'm not secure enough, I'm not settled enough in my differentiation in that from you, so I can't deal with it. Don't question me. But Jesus has asked question after question after question. Yeah, He's the kind of person who could be questioned, and he doesn't shut them down or shout them down. He invites conversation without bending his opinion, without kind of curtailing to the agenda but invites them in. Man, I don't think I'm going to get through all this. He was aware and obedient even to the smallest of the Father's words. He was angry at the right things, yeah. not the wrong things. Right. I'll tell you what, being a parent, you get angry at all the wrong things <laughs> all the time. But Jesus, not once, finds himself angry at the wrong thing. He expresses angry, anger, justly, righteously, at the things that anger God. He treats others as image bearers, not as objects to be used. He's faithful to his own word and to his Father's call. He's full of wisdom of God to help others to see the Father. He gives more than he receives. He's open to everyone, high status or low status. He had a private, practiced relationship with the Father that resulted in public power. He was free to use money and possessions and not be used by them. He was free from anxiety. He lived first what he asked of others. People were upset with him because he spoke a truth they couldn't handle, not because of the way he said it. He treated others how he would have wanted to be treated. He sought the realization of the kingdom of God with his whole life. He knew the Father. Like he didn't know of God the Father. He didn't have a set of doctrines about the Father. He knew the Father like a husband knows a wife. Like a partner knows a partner. He knew the Father. And there was no gap between what he said and how he lived. This is just a very, actual, very short picture of what a life of love looks like. And if you go back and read the Sermon on the Mount, this is just asking the question, how did Jesus live? Each of the points of the Sermon on the Mount. That's where that portrait came from. Jesus demonstrates a life of love. But when we see it, like, wouldn't you like to be that kind of person? I would. Wouldn't you like to be around that kind of person? Wouldn't you like your life, wife to be that kind of person? <laughs> but this is God's image. This is God's desire for the whole of humanity, that we would be by degree after degree moving to be this kind of people. There's a, there's a, an, a saint from the 12th century called Bernard. 
Bernard. Bernie. Bernie of Clairvaux. <laughs> <laughs> he joins a monastery at 12, uh, 12, 22. And by 25, he's asked to start and lead a new monastery. And although he's invited to many high positions in the church throughout his life, he stays stuck, planted, not stuck, committed to this monastery that he led till he died. He's written a beautiful book about love. And in it, he speaks about the four degrees of love. Because everything I've talked about so far feels like a long way off. It feels like an inapproachable distance. Pastor, easy to say from the front, but what about tomorrow, hey? He begins to speak about four degrees of love, how a person can move from the beginning toward that life of love. I want to give you those four degrees, and then I want to give you one practice that's really easy to say, will take the, life, the rest of your life to do, but if you will commit to it, it will transform you toward the person of the life of love. The four degrees are this. The first one, the love of self for self. The love of me for the sake of me. It's actually... Humanity is designed to love. And Jesus, when he says, treat others as you would be treated, there's a supposition there. He's presupposing that you actually love yourself. This is not a bad thing. But, like all things, our culture wants to take it too far. Treat yourself. Me time. He says this, when self-love becomes too lavish, it will overflow its natural boundaries mm -hmm. through the excessive love of pleasure and enslaves us to lust. Just a side pastoral thought. If you've got a lust issue in your life, it may be that you love yourself too much. I'll just leave that for you. <laughs> he says that self-love is held in check, held within its proper boundaries by the command to love our neighbor. How can we truly love our neighbor unless we love them in God? Mm -hmm. You cannot love your neighbor unless you love God, which leads us to the second degree of love, the love of God for the sake of myself. Can I say that? He did, so I'll blame him. When we first come to loving God, we might think it's pure, but in truth, we love God for his benefits. We love God because he is good to me. He saved me. I love him because he saved me. I was in a situation, I cried out for help, he rescued me from it. I was sick, I prayed. And he healed me. I had lack. I prayed and I received provision. I love God because he's good to me. This is actually not, not a bad place. The Heavenly Father permits it because it's an entry to the love of God. But Bernard says that because we want to move forward, right? We want to move forward to the love of God for God's sake. So how does God woo us from the love of God for my sake to the love of God for God's sake? And it's exactly that. He woos us by his generous gifts to us. That every time that we've been in stress, in trouble, we find the goodness of God. And as he continues consistently to be faithful to us, we find that the giver is more beautiful than the gift. That the provider is more wonderful and worthy of our love than the, one, the thing that he provided. And so through his grace and gift to us, he woos us to this place of loving him for his sake.
if you're at the degree where you love God for your own sake and you've just, as I've said it, the Holy Spirit's prompted you and be like, that's your degree. That's where you're at. It's not a place to beat yourself up. The question is, how do I progress forward? And the answer is, keep coming to Him in prayer. Keep receiving His good gift and His good grace and meditate on who it is that gives it to you. And as you do, you will find that your heart softens toward Him. How could you be in the presence of someone like that? It's so wonderful, so beautiful, and not have your heart softened to them. It happens to us on a human level. Yeah, someone's generous to you, open to you, loving to you. And like, it doesn't matter how you entered the relationship, their consistent grace to you softens your heart. It's hard to stay kind of distant and grumpy to a person who's just recklessly good to you, right? It kind of wears you down eventually. And you know, sometimes despite yourself, you find yourself... I mean, that's how I won my wife. <laughs> but this is God's strategy for wooing us. That He would relentlessly, recklessly extend grace upon grace to us. And as we desire to move forward... Keep receiving His grace. Keep coming to the communion table. Keep coming to worship. Keep coming to prayer and Scripture. And you will find that He is more wonderful than the thing that He offers you. And that your heart shifts to loving Him for His sake. And as we love God for God, it doesn't become hard to love our neighbor. Actually, the love of God flows out, kind of overflows the boundaries of our life toward one another. If your love for God doesn't result in a love that ends up horizontal, then there's more to go. He speaks of the final degree called the love of self for God's sake. He says he's not sure if this is attainable for your whole life in this life. This is the destination of the life of love. He says... He knows of people he himself had moments, you probably have had moments, where you're able to love yourself for the sake of God. You kind of lose yourself a little bit. You're not consumed with your ego and your desires and your ambition. You're just able to see yourself as he sees you. I think this is where Jesus says, ask whatever you desire and it will be given to you that your desires and your heart, the love that you have, is aligned for that time with the love that He has. And so as you pray those prayers, it's already a yes in heaven because it's the very thing that He wanted to do Himself. He's doing it through you. Okay. So one practice to move us forward. God's primary context for your growth in love is committed relationships. The practice is commitment. Staying where you are. I think Pastor Simon mentioned this uh, saying from someone we're reading the other week, but I'll read it. He said, faith isn't in your head. It's not just what you think. It's not in your heart. It's in your behind. It's in your butt. Why? Because it's where you sit. It's where you stay. It takes faith to stay. It takes faith to stay in your marriage when your head has gone elsewhere and your heart has gone elsewhere. Commitment is staying. It takes faith to stay in the local church that you find yourself in. When your head has gone somewhere and your heart goes elsewhere, it takes faith to stay. There's this account in John chapter 6 where Jesus does pro probably one of his hardest teachings. 
And he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. Spoiler alert, he's not talking about communion. Face value, he's talking about cannibalism. <laughs> and that's how it's received by his audience. The, the, he has many followers at this point, and they start turning away from him. So many so that he turns to his own disciples and say, are you too going to leave me? And Peter pipes up, because he does. And he says, where, this is John 6, where else have we to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. What he doesn't say is, I totally get what you're saying and I understand it. He kind of says, I don't really get what you're saying here. And the bit that I do get... I don't like, <laughs> but I know better than to go because I've found that in my commitment to you, there's eternal life and I'll trust that in time it'll work itself out and maybe my head and my heart will catch up, but in the meantime, it's staying where it's staying <laughs> and I'm not going anywhere. And I want to tell you, if you want to grow in the life of love, find the relationships that you're in commitment to them come hell or high water as much as you're able stay in your marriage now there are situations and circumstances absolutely where that's not appropriate but that's the exception stay in your marriage and that's why God uses kids a lot to disciple us because you can't leave them <laughs> it's a committed relationship that you can't bail from so God's like oh, I got you where I want you as much as you're able stay in your church your head might disagree with something your heart might go wandering after something but stay talk it out commit stay in your connect group stay in your friendships just be ruggedly committed to Resolving the issues that are going to come. That, right. They're going to be issues. Right. You're human. The people you're in relationship with are human. <laughs> stay there. And if you stay long enough, you'll get disillusioned. There's a, a stat that we call the seven-year itch when we're talking about marriage. The divorce... Uh, rate is the highest on average around the seventh year of marriage. So we call the seven, seven year itch. Why is that? I think it's because it takes seven years to actually see the person who's in front of you, not the illusion of the person that was <laughs> in front of you. Like the person you're marrying isn't really the person you're marrying. <laughs> you're marrying, yeah, I'm getting some nods, particularly from the the person you're marrying, <laughs> the person you're marrying is the, the image, your image of the person you're marrying, which is fine because we probably need that to get married. <laughs> Particularly the women in the church, yeah. But at some point, that illusion kind of flickers out and we're confronted with the person that we said till death do us part and by that point the relationship settled and she can't go anywhere well she can but if we commit to the vow then the work of the spirit will begin to transform us and teach us the life of love not just marriage. It'll take you seven years to see what kind of church this really is. And when you do, it won't be the church that you thought you were part of. There's this line, do you know the movie Inception? It's like old now. Yeah, yeah, great movie. And the, anyway, if you don't know, uh, it's all about going into dreams and the, the protagonist has... Uh, in the dream state, uh, a, a wife 
who is his wife, but it's not his real wife, it's his projection of his wife. I should not have picked Inception to explain it. <laughs> as I'm saying it now, <laughs> as I realize, <laughs> he's in a dream, he's got a dream wife in front of him, and it, part of the movie is him wrestling with the, the loss of his wife. And part of the reason he keeps going into the dream is because he can have this image of his wife before him. And at the climactic moment of uh, the confrontation, when he realizes that he can't live with the illusion of a wife any longer, he says this. He says, I can't imagine you with all your complexity, with all your perfection, all your imperfection. Look at you. You're just a shade. You're just a shade of my real wife the best I can do, but I'm sorry, you're just not good enough. I believe God wants to get you to that place in your relationships where the illusion falls away. Because your illusion of your wife, the illusion of this church, the illusion of your kids, the illusion of the projected image of who these people are, are just a shade of the reality of the person who's in front of you that God has created, of the church that God has pulled together. It's just, and you're, you're just not that good at imagining. But the creator of all, his imagination, so to speak, is much more profound than yours. Much more, and you, the, all the perfection and the imperfection of the people who he's brought into your life, if you would stay, you would see. And when you finally meet your partner, when you finally meet your church, when you finally meet the people who are in front of you, it's disillusioning in one sense because we imagine these perfect things that can't really stand the test of reality. But the person or the group or the people that we meet are so profoundly rich and wonderful because they are the image bearers of Christ created by God himself. And as we do that, we find that we start to take forward steps in this life of love because we begin to... I'll finish. I keep talking for like another hour. Would you just bow your heads this morning? Let's, let's pray. Let's pray. It's, it's an extreme image, but... This morning, do you hear the Spirit of God calling to you, saying, why not become all flame? Why not make the pursuit of your life to love God with your whole self? And just like it, to love the people of your world as you love yourself. Do you hear the call of the Spirit to you this morning? many of you who do why not pray this morning that the spirit would give you the enabling power to move into that life to move forward in the life of love if you don't and you don't want to don't this is not religion don't just do it because I said it but if you do as I'm speaking in the spirit is calling to you and saying, this is the destiny of your life. Father, I pray for every person who's saying yes on the inside. Your picture of true humanity is wonderful, but it does feel like an inapproachable distance to us, Lord. If these people are a bit like me, then my willpower and their willpower is insufficient. We need something beyond ourselves to help us move forward. It's your spirit. Mm -hmm. So we pray, Lord, for a fresh grace mm -hmm. from your Holy Spirit. Lord, to keep our seat, to stay where we are. Lord, I pray for those who are in marriages that are really hard at the moment. Father, I pray for the courage to stay mm -hmm. and for the grace for a way through. 
Lord, I pray for those who are in parent relationships, child-to-parent relationships that are really challenging, where self-protection would distance ourselves. Father, I pray for the courage to stay. I pray for the grace for a new day to come. Lord, for work situations, for church situations, for connect group situations, for friendship situations, all the places where we are called, or we feel a call away from the relationship, I pray now for the courage, come from the Holy Spirit, to stay where you've put us, Lord. And that in our staying, in our commitment, Lord, would you teach us about the way of love? Would you progress us? in the life of love. Father, I want my life to look like the life of Jesus. Would you help me? Would you help us? Make us a people who look like your son. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. Well done. Fantastic. Fantastic. Here's the deal. How many people in the room have got the Holy Spirit? Come on. Many of us. So some of us maybe don't know much about what's going on. But here's the thing. The flame, the fire, is that, is Him. And you're on an ongoing journey towards a future where you're glorified. Where, as Pastor Ben said, we... Uh, we know as we are already known and we see as we are already seen. So he's already working. It's like you've already started the journey. It's just a matter of allowing him to break out some of those things that are in the way of us growing. So, you know, that. do I want to become the flame? Well, God is a flame. He's, he's a fire and the fire is already in me. And, he, and even if you don't know him yet, you are destined for it. Because you're made in his image. So without, without that happening, we're never ever going to reach our goal. And so we're never ever going to be satisfied. But praise God, we can. Amen. So let's say yes to it. Why don't we all stand this morning? Lord, I'm just so grateful. We're so grateful for that very practical word about the way we love hard to love ourselves we get it all wrong we over love and then we under love so I pray for us Lord refresh our understanding of your love for us there is simply nobody in the cosmos who loves us as much as you do. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive our sins and and they just disappear out of existence when we confess them to you. So thank you that we're loved. I pray that that love would Increase more and more in confidence, in faithfulness, in fearlessness, in courage, in connection, in honesty, in spirit, in Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And um, in love, if you would like um, one of the pastors to pray with you in the front area in the next five minutes, just jump forward and we'd love to talk with you or pray with you. It would be awesome. And uh, God bless you. Don't forget, what's next week? 40th 40th celebration. It's going to be awesome. Amen.